Hello everyone, uh, this is Igor Kafitz and I'm extremely excited to have this uh, call with the big old John Carlton, the guy who I've been admiring ever since I wore my marketing diapers, if you will. And uh, John, can you hear me? Yes, hear you just fine, Igor. Good, good to be talking with you again. Same here, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I appreciate so much you taking the time to do this. I know you're busier than a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, so there I'm gonna, go. I'm gonna shoot right to the first question that I've got here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so just, just to give a brief introduction to our listeners, we are talking about email marketing and specifically about how we can, you know, how we can get our list to behave. And by behave, of course, we mean respond to our emails, open them, read them, click on the links and buy our stuff. So my first question is, how do you create that ongoing relationship with the reader and not just that, you know, one time sale? Yeah, that's a great question, Igor, and that, that actually is the crux of almost all marketing. One of the big breakthroughs that I had early in my career when I was hanging out with Jay Abraham, and I'm sure that most people on your list know who Jay is or they will, they will ask you or, or you, can, you can define it to them later, but Jay was a pioneer in bringing what we call old, old school salesmanship to the modern world. And by old school salesmanship, I'm talking about the tactics that salesmen used back when primarily sales were done either face-to-face, -face, later maybe on the phone. But they were done one human at a time to another human. So there was, there was a real relationship going on, even if that relationship was only a minute old or five minutes old or or you know, it wasn't really going anywhere. These guys made their 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 living by bonding and and uh, uh, it, it, making people feel comfortable with them and quickly finding out you know where where the prospect was at what the prospect needed and how he could best serve the prospect so that a deal went down so that the sale sale was made uh, in the new world where we're reaching thousands of people at, at a time sometimes millions of people especially online uh, we tend to forget that it all comes down to even if you as a marketer are reaching you know th a thousand people right now with with your email and that of course is low as say thirty thousand is on your list um, it's still one person at the other end of your email responding to something that you're writing it is still a one-to-one -one relationship uh, no matter how many other people are involved that's why uh, some people get got confused with um, with email back when uh, I know you you're you're young Igor you may not even remember but when people were able to personalize emails uh, when that first started happening uh, about uh, about a decade ago marketers went nuts with personalizing everything so subject lines became personalized so it'd go Igor here's a message for you from John and then it would start out dear Igor this is John you know and they went nuts with this and what was interesting and this this kind of highlights your your question here is that that's not a relationship just knowing the other person's first name is not a real marketing relationship it is a uh, a gimmick and what happened was the smarter um, marketers out there who still wanted the effect of trying to reach that one one on one human to human uh, relationship situation started dropping using first names because everybody was using first names both in the subject line and in the beginning of the email and the reason they did that is because they knew from long experience that friends or people that really really have relationships don't often start out with a dear Igor in other words if if I was sending you an email and you knew it was for me uh, the subject line might be open this right now you idiot and then I'd have I wouldn't say dear Igor I wouldn't even say Igor I just launch into what I was saying I said I've got a great new you know uh, article that I, that I need you to see right now here's the link and blah 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 so people started stop using uh, the uh, personalization tactic now what this is just kind of kind of a surface um, uh, uh, thing going on, but it but it has a much deeper meaning because when we talk about relationships, we really are talking about what the old school guys knew to be bonding, which would be some kind of yeah, I'm just like you, or my 
my interests align with your interests or uh, I actually know something about the situation you're in. I either experience it personally or the business I'm in means that I have to be very, very aware of what you're going through. So I'm a guy you can talk to who is going to know something about you. I'm not just hammering at you. I'm not just trying to sell you something. I'm actually trying to help you either solve a problem, make your life better, do something like this. This is the bonding stuff that goes on. It's It has to be quick. It has to be... Um, it has to be done with a certain amount of, of sincerity and, and, and honesty. And there has to be an exchange of value. And that exchange of, of value can be in the emotional realm. It can, be, it can be identifying with somebody. It can be identifying with their politics, their religion, their, their situation in life. What, whatever it is that creates that sense that I'm on your side or you and I have have similar interests. So that's the bonding thing. The other thing you do is share secrets. Uh, this is why a lot of marketers in their email relationships with their lists are often talking about secrets or sharing something of value. And they often will do that without without making that part of the sales process. Really good marketers will, at least occasionally and sometimes often, send out emails that have nothing to do with the business at hand. They are offering some kind of fresh information. Like, I mean, when was the last time you sent out an email to your list alerting them to something that maybe even one of your competitors are doing or alerted them to uh, some a, a great article you just read in the uh, in the uh, International Herald Tribune or or just just let them know that you discovered a new tactic that can be used and and here it is right now just just this sharing that goes on and when when you keep thinking about how how do people really react in real life one to one on one your customers know they're not your your best friend. They they know they're not going to get invited to your daughter's wedding. They're not being invited over for Thanksgiving. They're not necessarily going to get a gift on their birthday or even a card or something. Although that's that's a bonding tactic that old school salesmen uh, used to use a lot. Would be contact people on their birthdays. But they there is a relationship between colleagues and there's a relationship between somebody who's actually has some authority in your life. Somebody who's running the list or the website that you're paying attention to and 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 you so reaching out and and letting them into your confidence is actually a way to further the the relationship and anybody listening to me talk here knows that I'm I'm kind of bouncing off of two main uh, resources for salesmen the first is um, how to win friends and influence people um, which is a book that was written back in the 30s, and it's been updated a few times, but I actually read the one of the original edits from the 30s, and that was called The Salesman's Bible for decades. It's kind of fallen out of favor again. I would highly recommend anybody who has anything to do with other people, that who any, anyone in business who has to deal with other people should read that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Just swallow your pride, read it, and know that it's helped a lot of people, including me, Gary Halbert, uh, 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 Jay, Jay Abraham, Dan Kennedy, all of the guys that you hear about have read that book. The other thing is uh, NLP, which would be Neuro Linguistic Programming, which talks about things like, like bonding and and reframing uh, uh, relationships and doing things. So, so some, a lot of that language has leaked into the the marketer's uh, uh, toolkit because it's all about quickly establishing some kind of, of relationship with people that often you you aren't going to be able to meet. I I have people who have known me for years only through the email exchanges that we have, or only through the email. Uh, that they get from me. They've never met me. They've never. They don't know what I look like. They wouldn't be able to pick me out of a crowd. Yet they feel they know me, and they feel that I know something about them because of the relationship that goes on during this thing. Finally, one of the ways to establish an ongoing relationship is if you are in a position to help guide them into a world or a niche. Or, or something that they don't otherwise have access to, then you become the window to that world. You become the guide. You become the, the, 
the person who's going to sneak them into the party. You're the guy who's going to show them the secret entrance that nobody else knows about. You're the guy that's going to bring them in and welcome them with open arms so they always have a friend or they have somebody they can rely on in this new world. And this new world could be the world of marketing, could be a niche, uh, like a part of marketing, like like you are you, you uh, uh, you know you coach people. So it, you know you you understand what you're going to coach them, and for you it's a known world for the people coming into that world it's an unknown world it's it's full of uh, potential danger and and all kinds of surprises both pleasant and unpleasant and probably pitfalls and nobody wants to fail and everybody wants to feel confident and, and, and competent and if you become that person who's going to say I will you know I will figuratively uh, uh, hold your hand and walk walk with you in, into this room and I'll be there you know if you have questions I'm gonna make this even a pleasant experience for you because this is going to be new but I am your I am your guide I am the guy that's helping you into this new world and a lot of marketers forget that that and it doesn't just have to be coaching it could be a new product when you call customer service because you can't figure out the new iOS system on your on on your iMac um, that person you know it, you are putting yourself in their hands so there is a there is a relationship going on with the person you're talking to just just in a, in a customer service situation and and if you start thinking critically about how the balance of power is there, how much you're trusting them, at what point maybe they break that trust, at what point they further that trust, at what point they are actively helping you out so much that you happily fill out the uh, the form that you're sent by Apple afterwards, which is, you know, have you, when, you know, we noticed you just talked to customer service. How was your experience? They're always asking you know, about that. And most people don't bother filling that stuff out. But sometimes you reach somebody who really helps you. You feel so good about it. You want to help them back. And when you start to look deeply at how that little mini relationship happens, you you will never talk to this person again. The chances of you calling into customer service and reaching that same person again are pretty much nil. And yet you you have an experience and you may feel good enough about that experience that you want to do something for that relationship even though you're never going to see them again. You're certainly not inviting them over for Thanksgiving dinner. All of this stuff comes into play. These little tidbits of human interaction that happen in the real world are things that good marketers understand are absolutely essential for a uh, for someone to stay in touch with their list to get them to open the email uh, that you send out to get them to I mean that's the first step before we way before you're wondering about response to to your email so the worst thing you can have in your email is somebody gets an email from Igor and they say, oh, that's going straight to the uh, straight to the trash. I don't need to hear what he has to say. You know, who cares what Igor has to say? The response you want is, hey, an email from Igor. I wonder what that nutcase has to say today. Or what's Igor got to tell me today? You know, and you're, you anticipate a pleasant or a profitable or a... Um, you know, a, a very positive experience when you get into that. All of this falls under the rubric of relationship. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, that makes perfect sense. In fact, I want to kind of just go back on two points that you mentioned. For one, mm -hmm. one of the first self-help books I've ever read was the, uh, you know, How to Influence People uh, by uh -huh. Carnegie. And I got to yeah. tell you, that book helped me in many different ways in my life, but the most profound way it did help me is I got a job. My first job I got thanks to that book, right? And that job, you know, the money I got from that, I funded my business forward. So it was literally a life-changing book for me. And I reread it like three times already, even after I yeah. became mega successful online. So I, I recommend, you know, just like you, John, I really do recommend anyone who's in sales, marketing, human potential business, or any sort of influence whatsoever should read the book. Now, uh, another thing you mentioned, which was really profound, but we kind of slided over to the next thing, was you know you, you asked when was the last time you've emailed your list about something your competition is doing, and mm -hmm. the reason it resonated with me so much is because a couple of weeks ago there was a big shake in in our industry here in the home based business opportunity industry, and there was you know one company that kicked out a big affiliate 
out because the affiliate made some sort of announcement. So there was a big ruckus about it. And so the guy uh -huh. was, was so big that he had like 32 or 34,000 people that he brought personally into that company. And so I spoke about that in an email I sent out to my buyer list with absolutely no ulterior motive, just speaking to them and bringing this to their awareness, saying how their business might be in danger because of that, because now there's 30, you know, something thousand people are wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. And, um, you know, that resonated so much with my list that I got, first off, I got an amazing response. I had people actually replying to my emails and, and, and conversations started. And second, I actually brought in a bunch of business just from that one email because people who were on my list but weren't paying attention, right, all of a sudden, you know, a button clicked or something happened and they start paying attention again and they reached out and orders, you know, came in just from that email that supposedly had nothing to do with me promoting anything to them. So right. that, that was an amazing tip that, you know, that, that's already brought me a lot of money, but I did it on accident. So mm -hmm. now we can actually do it more consciously and do it more often. Okay, well, that was, you know, a great start for the call. Uh, so my next question is actually something that pretty much most people, this is what they want to know. They don't want to know anything yeah. else. They just want to know this. So, John, what are some of your best email subject lines? Well, it's interesting. I know several people, Igor, in business. I think you know some of them, like like Big Jason and maybe, you know, um, uh, Bond Halbert, guys like that, who have had... Um, who have spent a lot of time thinking about email and especially about subject lines. You're absolutely right. It's one of the one of the main things that uh, people look for. I think it's it, and it, when you talk about subject lines, the easiest thing for people who are already involved in marketing in some way, the way for them to understand it is that it's a headline. That is true up to a certain point. Now it's not necessarily a headline because a headline in an ad or a even a video or anything you have a lot more control over a headline than you do over your subject line in an email because the email it's probably closer to the 140 character limit in in Twitter than anything else the limits that you have in a subject line have to do with winding up in the spam box winding up having the, the uh, uh, majority of your message not even show up in the inbox because it's too long. So if you start out by saying, you know what, uh, I've got something important to share with you, and, and that is your subject line. You're actually writing in that conversational tone. The person may only see in their inbox, you know what, comma, I, and then it, it, none of the important stuff that you're saying gets across. So there's a whole different way of thinking about this much like people had people who use twitter I, i'm not a huge fan of twitter but i certainly mastered the 140 character uh dance so to speak fairly quickly because old school writers like me i used to have to write for either publications like uh, my ad would go into a magazine or a newspaper where there was very limited space and um uh or even in direct mail where you only had a certain number of pages. Every new page you had to print and put into the envelope would add to the weight and would add to the cost of the mailing. So you really wanted to be succinct and space mattered. So we learned early on how to be concise, how to operate within limits. So these new limits that the online world has presented to the old school guys like me, we just knew we had to adapt in some new way. And in email, you know, with the limits of what you can say. For example, and I don't even know if this is true right now, but but for a while there, about five years ago, when I was writing an email, the list of words that would help you wind up in the spam folder were amazing. Like the word business, you know, B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S -S -S would often would often be tagged in if people had their control set really high. However, B-I-Z would not. Um, so it's th things as innocent as that were being targeted. And this is part of the over response that online um, authority takes. It's like Google trying to, you know, the big Google slap was trying to take care of people they considered unethical or they didn't want them to be using 
uh, uh, ad words or they didn't want them to be um, – uh, to be the, the the face of what Google was trying to do with with reaching people through through both both Google AdWords and AdSense and things like that, but the slap picked up a lot of innocent marketers who just didn't understand what was going on, and quite innocently they got picked up in this, and it's kind of like the heavy hand of of an authority, say, um, uh, you know, somebody decides to shut down a nightclub because they don't like that the nightclub is whatever. There's something illegal going on there. So they go in and, and shoot it up or blow it up. And they hurt a lot of innocent people on both sides of the nightclub and outdoors and all kinds of, of bad stuff happens. This is constantly happening online because of the bludgeoning way that people try to exert some kind of control. Uh, this happens on Amazon, this happens on Google, this happens on Facebook, this happens anywhere there is centralized control and they're fumbling around trying to get rid of the bad guys without hurting the good guys. I've never seen an example where, where they've been very good at it. So when you're writing your subject lines, if your business depends on email, you need at least every week, one of the first things you do Monday is you get up and you do a search for what's going on with subject lines or, you know, what, what, you know, why is my email winding up in the spam folder? Even if it's not, just find out what's going on. See if there's any news going on to, to words to how language might be getting you in trouble. Find out about this. There are little, I, I'm, I'm sure you do it, Igor. My assistant who sends, actually does the physical act of sending out my emails, runs everything I write through a couple of, of easy uh, uh, spam tests to see if any of the words light up the the spam filters, you know, and, and, we, and we, we don't try to go for a perfect score, but we try to get it as high as possible. So we're going to wind up in the inboxes of the most of the highest number of people that, that, that we can without surrendering what I need to do to be able to get my message across. So there's a dance going on there. So some of the best subject lines you can do, and, and I mentioned there are a number of people who are paying attention to this. I have seen their reports from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, and I know what they're currently doing. And the reason they stay in business as quote unquote email experts is because the game keeps changing. So there's no such thing as pulling out a great subject line from five years ago that worked like gangbusters and expecting it to work now. You have to be fluid. You have to understand what's going on. Now that said, there are a couple of different ways that you can reach out to people. Um, if, if people understand how headlines work, one of the main categories of headlines is curiosity. Curiosity headlines in the grand scheme of things do not pull as well in ads as informative headlines or intriguing headlines or what I like to call outrageous headlines. Like my, um, there is some element of, of curiosity, but it's not, um, let me, let me give you a, a, a quick example. This is a headline. This is not a, a email subject line. This is a headline. It, uh, the, the, one of my more famous ones was um, uh, the amazing uh, secrets of a one-legged golfer, for example. Now, that is somewhat curiosity-based, but it's not uh, – oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's how the secrets of a one-legged golfer will help you drive – uh, drive farther and putt better and lower your score, something, something like that. So that was the informative headline. That was taking a, a, an outrageous premise and then bringing it home to, you know, this is outrageous and this is how it's going to help you. The curiosity headline would be um, the amazing secrets of, of a one-legged golfer. That rests purely on the curiosity value of the cognitive dissonance of a, of a one-legged guy trying, trying to golf. Um, you, you have to understand whether your um, headlines that start with the word why, like why does this um, golfer have, you know, why, why does this young golfer who's 150 pounds soaking wet yet hits the ball 400 yards, which is, which is very far, by the way, if you're not a golfer, um, you know, care how you're 
how, how you're hitting the ball off of the tee. That would be a pure curiosity headline. I'm asking a question. You would have to read further to find out what the answer is. Uh, an informative one would be um, how to hit the ball further, uh, parenthesis, explained by a 150-pound soaking wet kid who actually hits 400-yard drives regularly in heavy competition. So that would be an informative one. You have to read more to get the information. I'm kind of splitting hairs here a little bit, but it's important to understand when you get to the very limited amount of space you have in a subject line to be able to bring people in. The only job of the subject line is to get them to click on the email in their inbox so that they see the body of the email. So when you understand the job of the subject line is not to, not to make a sale, not to, not to do anything other than to get them to immediately get into the, into the um, uh, body of the email. In other words, you don't want them to like flag it, you know, for later. I'll read this later. Here's something from Eagle. I'll bet this is pretty interesting. You flag it and then you go do something else. A good salesman knows chances of him coming back and actually reading your email are very, very low. You, you need him to get in there right now. So the guys that I know that study email stuff and track response rates know that these curiosity type headlines, which are now called clickbait, uh, clickbait, that's a uh, C-L-I-C-K-B-A-I-T, which means that places like everything from the New York Times to um, Huffington Post to a lot of places that either make money through clicks or use the number of clicks they get to go to advertisers to say this is how many people are looking at our sites or whatever, have learned that high, high interest curiosity headlines work very well to bring people into their publication. Now, sometimes if what they say in the little headline or, or, or the little blurb that incites all this interest or curiosity, if they don't fulfill on that, then they get negative comments and stuff and they're, they're playing a bad game. They're playing a bad faith game. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, if, if you put out a, some kind of uh, teaser headline saying, you know, here's, here's 10 pictures of Mar Marilyn Monroe in her prime naked, and then your story has, ha, I was just fooling you, I just wanted you to read my email, so here's what I've got, I'm really selling, you know, you know uh, tickets on a cruise ship somewhere. That's a disconnect, and that's not good. You may get a high open rate, you won't get much, much of a conversion rate. So you have to balance all this out. The clickbait stuff that's going on is really turning up the cynicism out there. So people are getting a little ticked off that they're being forced to look at things that, that they later say, well, that was a waste of 10 minutes and I'll never get it back. So they're, we're in the middle of a high uh, volume period of fake outs of people being faked out, not just in email, but also in blurbs, in, um, uh, in, in ad words, in, um, in, in all kinds of, of funnels where people are being funneled somewhere. The, the most famous one is the, uh, now it's several years old. It's like one weird secret to losing weight or something. Uh, the, the, the variations of that have been used a lot. And they actually tested the word weird against strange, bizarre. They used all kinds of different words to, and they keep coming back to weird because that just works a lot. People are trained to think that weird is a word that's going to be a, this should be interesting or I really need to know this. I would like to know what the one food is that's going to make me lose belly fat immediately. And of course, the they, they almost never follow through on that. So there is a high degree of feeling like you got taken. So a lot of people in email courses have talked about using these curiosity style headlines to get people into the email. You, I'm just warning you, you need to be careful about the difference between bringing somebody into your email and then, you know, so having high open rates as opposed to getting people to actually act on what you want to do. So the job of the subject line is just to get them into the body of the letter. In doing that, how would you talk to somebody who you actually had a relationship, who you cared about, who you like to entertain? You know, they, they can be funny, they can be odd, they can be offbeat. All of this relates back to your personality 
as far as it relates to the relationship you have with your list. Your list thinks of you as a human being if you are the face of your of of your business. Igor, you are the face of your business. So people don't talk about your bi- being on your business list. They talk about being on Igor's list. Uh, people in my business don't talk about being on the Carlton Inc. list. They talk about being on John Carlton's list or John's list. So they have an idea, rightly or wrongly, they have an idea in their head of what my personality is. As much as I can, I like to control that. At least, uh, you know, I, you know, I present myself as kind of a wacky guy who's got a lot of information, a lot of experience with, with advice that works like crazy. So all, all of this ties into that. It's, it's not, it's not easy for everyone to do. I naturally was able to do that. I actually know big marketers, high end online marketers who studied their personality very carefully for a very long time and crafted their personality to be able to fit what they felt they needed to be seen as. It was like an acting job to their list. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. I will tell you it's easiest to be, excuse me, to be who you are, uh, to not try to invent something. But if you are an interesting guy. If in real life you have a lot of friends and you're, you know, occasionally the life of the party or you, you know, you, or you can hold the attention of a room full of people when you're talking about business or something, go ahead and be that guy. Go ahead and expand on that and, and don't be shy about that. If you are boring and you have, you know, if you start talking, even if you're sharing the secrets of how to make a million dollars by this time tomorrow and you can't hold the attention of the room, then you got some other problems. You probably want to start working on some things. Read Dale, uh, Dale Carnegie again, and um, uh, you know start start to to help yourself. But whatever the re, the personality that you have with your your list, whatever that relationship is, you can use that to shortcut things like subject lines. So for me to say, you know, I don't need to say in a subject line, I don't need to tell a long story. First of all, I can't because I don't have the room in a subject line, but I can shortcut a lot of things. So I can, I can, you know, I can rely a little bit. You don't, you don't want to rely too much, but I can rely a little bit on the relationship I already have with my list that, that I'm trusting that a percentage of them, not everyone, of course, but a percentage of them are going to be more or less open to opening my email when they see it in the inbox. If they're, you know, it, uh, they, they may be too busy to do it, but there's a percentage of them who always open my emails. There's a percentage that sometimes open my emails. They're doing a little, um, um, uh, uh, you know, a little balancing act. Ah, do I have time? Do I want to see what he's got? He's probably selling me something or he's got something that's going to take me 15 minutes because it's going to be interesting and I'm going to watch a video he's going to make me watch and I don't want to do that right now. Or, you know, maybe they say, you know what, nothing I'd rather do right now than see what Carlton has to say. Let's, let's, let's at least give him an opening. So I'm able to shortcut that and sometimes have very short emails like, open this now, you idiot. I've actually used th- things like that. And I'm forgiven, <clears throat> and uh, I, I wouldn't use that with a client, you know, who didn't have that kind of relationship, but I'm, I'm shortcutting it. So it's kind of like you're, you're yelling across a room at somebody who isn't coming your way, who, do, who, who knows you, but isn't inclined to, to come over your way. They might say, hey, there's Igor across the room. And then you look at them and you get their attention, you wave your hand and you yell something. What are you yelling to get their attention so they stop, excuse themselves from whatever they're doing. They'll say, excuse me, I got to go see what Igor's up to. And they walk across the room, actually, actually physically do something. In, in an email, the physical action is merely clicking clicking the mouse and, and going to an email or popping on their screen, you know, t- tapping their screen and moving forward. It, it seems like a simple act in the world of business. That's a huge act. As we all know who have email lists, the difference in open rates can be astonishing between a, a, a subject line that works and one that doesn't work. So, uh, Igor, as usual, I've gone way off on tangents. Would, is there, would you like to bring me back somewhere on this, or does this explain anything, or does this leave more questions unanswered than answered? Well, I'd say it brings us down to 
to the background of how you think when you craft a headline uh, or you craft a yeah. subject line. That is a good thing. That's something we, we obviously need to know if we want to go long term and, and over time create a, a huge swipe file of the headlines that work for us by testing the different approaches. But like I said before, what people really want, and I'm sorry for being like that, but that's what people want. I mean, it's just <laughs> human nature, I guess. We all want some specific subject lines. So perhaps just a couple of templates that you know our listeners can use tonight uh, to, well, we can't guarantee response, but I guess just increase the chances that they have to get someone to open their emails. Well, I'll, I'll have to bounce it right back. I don't work from a formula or a template. Actually, I'm popping on and I'm going to see I'm just looking at my sent email right now. All right. So while you do that, let me kind of go back to what you said. Uh, you mentioned something called uh, clickbait. And this is something that I noticed uh, about two and a half, three years ago when the ClickBank launch fiesta was happening. And there was a lot of gurus that were pretty much banking a million or two every day by launching these, you know, a low ticket ClickBank products and then upselling you to the high heavens with done for you elements and software and funnels and stuff like that. And what happened was there was a trend and the trend was mailing the list saying if stuff like uh, you got $400 in commission spending, click here to claim. And then, you know, the user clicks, or, you know, the, the reader clicks on the, on the link and they land on the sales page that sells them something. You know, now that is classic clickbait, but not only that, it generated so much bad will that for one, mm -hmm. people stopped responding to it. Two, people got their accounts shut down. So it's not just about killing response anymore, it's about getting into trouble for real and getting lo losing your list and losing your asset uh, by, by doing something like that. So therefore, another thing you mentioned, which was really important, whenever you use a curiosity or shock technique to get someone to open their email, uh, you definitely want to pay it off real, real quick in the email just to avoid this bad will. And uh, this is something to remember, especially if you're the kind of guy that has the balls to test things. You know, because a lot of people people would prefer to just use something proven, but there's also uh, guys who are pioneers and they are willing to test it out. So just like you said, John, I mean, you mailed the list and you actually used the term, you know, open up this email right now, you idiot. You know, I would probably never have the balls to do something like that but some people do so whenever you do it uh, you know I encourage you to do it because this is how you find breakthrough you know you just test things out uh, but definitely pay it off in the email real real quick here's here's what I would recommend right now Igor is for anybody to and this is worth doing anyway think of how you the language that you use to get the attention of the avatar or the average prospect on your list. In other words, if you don't know who you're talking to, if you don't know what they're, how they speak, if they use a lot of slang, if Eng English is a second language, for example, or if they, uh, if they use a lot of buzzword, industry buzzwords, if they, if they like, um, if, if they're well read, maybe they're, they're very literate, or maybe they're up on the, uh, on the socioeconomic ladder, wherever they are, there is a certain kind of language that, that they use. Now, when I said, you know, open this now, you idiot, the, the word idiot, of course, is the one you would circle and say, hmm, am I going to use that? You know, could I, could I back off on that? Could I increase that? How dangerous is it to use a word like that? This is all getting down to power words. One of the most interesting free reports I wrote over a decade ago, still the one that is most referenced and still used as a tool by a lot of writers I know, is just called the Power Words Report. And I went through two dozen of my pieces and I pulled out all the verbs, the, the action verbs and phrases that I used that that were part of the appeal of my writing, that raised my writing from boring to really exciting. And, uh, and, and, and I explained how ch choice of verbs really mattered. And it was just, it's just like 30 pages of nothing but verbs. So instead of using the word go or walk, for example, well, walk is the one I, 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 I made the best example of. It's like, how many different ways can you say walk? You, you can say, I walk down the street. Or if you want to jack up the interest level of this, you say, I floated down the street in, uh, you know, in, in an air of impassioned uh, love. Or I waltz down the street. Or I skipped 
down the street or I dance down the street, things like this. The words you use matter. If you can make a list of the words, that, especially the verbs, what I call the action verbs, excuse me, <coughs> make a list of those words that you use or would use if you were hanging out with people on your list that they would respond to. And this could include industry buzzwords that are specific to the industry that you and your email recipient are in, slang that they might understand if, they, if they're if they on your list because they think you're a hip young millennial and, and, and that's how you're coming across, speak in millennial language, you know, who cares if you're not, if you're not understood by the, you know, the, the uh, baby boom generation because they're not big on your list. If, however, they are on your list, then you got to be careful about that stuff. But make this list of things. And sometimes those words, those single power words, especially buzzwords or words that you can um, uh, uh, use to identify and be part of the personality exchange that you have with your list. I, I know several, uh, I actually used it myself, the word awesome raised in value, especially to the millennial generation, they just started using the word awesome a lot. My generation, the baby boomers, we used bitchin' a lot, which, you know, is a surf term. And so I've actually seen good emails with high open rates where nothing, the only thing in the subject line was the word awesome with an exclamation mark. Awesome. And that communicated enough to their list and this came from from a guy who had kind of a surfer attitude about things and he was kind of hip but also very knowledgeable and knew inside stuff. So when he said awesome, it, a whole story started to bloom. Whereas if someone else had said that, it might not mean anything to the, to, to the recipient. I can't say bitchin', <laughs> although I've used that word a lot uh, in, in other ways. Um, but if I could, uh, because that would, you know, that would be flagged, I think. Uh, but if it wasn't, it, I would be able to communicate, <coughs> excuse me, to my fellow baby boomers very clearly that this is the equivalent of awesome. So a single word can carry the, a, a large part of the story that, that, that you're trying to tell. Um, you, you know, but you have to balance it against what you can say and what you can't say. So, for example, um, you know, you, if a, you know, new coaching opportunity is not going to do really well because I would have to, you know, if I'm, if I got an email from you, Igor, that said something like that, first I'd have to be interested in coaching. Probably not. You got to sell me on the idea of actually doing that. Opportunity really doesn't mean much to me. And new, it's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. So I'm, you're not going to get a high opening rate. On, on the other hand, if you position it as, um, um, you know, something like, <clears throat> you know, new coaching opportunity you can't have or um, um, why, why, uh, why are guys like you being refused this opportunity? Um, you know, so, so, so you're, you're or beginning why to I don't craft coach the anymore, story. Something like that. Pardon me? Why I don't do coaching anymore. You know, yeah. or the douchebag yes. that yes. that is guilty yeah. of, of having me quit coaching or something like that. Right. So what, what you do is, is you start to get to the story that matters. Now, if you're going to somebody who doesn't doesn't do coaching, doesn't value coaching, has no idea who you are, um, you know, is is only vaguely interested in anything you have to say, that's not going to trigger it. So the difference between that and awesome or let's take let's take the word awesome, you know, awesome awesome conversion rates, you know, parenthesis, I never thought I'd get, you know, or, you know, you know, uh, 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 good for the next week only or, or some, just some kind of, of way of doing that. And then you bring, you know, and then if I'm interested in that, like conversion rates, then, then I might be, it just raises my level of interest. But anybody who's in, you know, who's, who's in email marketing knows that you're, you're never dealing with, you know, high, high open rates. I mean, a lot of people live off of a under, t under 5% open rates, you know, 10% becomes a huge hit for them. And, uh, when they start getting up into 20, 25%, that's like astronomical figures. And anybody who tells you they're getting a 50% open rate on their email is lying or their list consists of two people, one of which is their mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so so you're you're not trying to reach everybody. You're trying to to get. You're trying to shake out the people who are going to be uh, high high value candidates for the funnel that you start. All you want to want them to do is to get into the email. So the job of the subject line is to get them to open the email. And that, and if you think about that, then stop thinking about trying to close a deal, to make a sale, to do anything other than bring them in with the caveat that you aren't you don't want that oh yuck reaction. You don't want them to get in there and say, well, this has nothing to do with the subject line. I feel cheated. So be very aware of that. Don't try to trick people, but rather try to start the conversation. Like I said, what could you yell across the room to get somebody to stop doing what they're doing and come over to see what you've got? And then and then when you continue that conversation, you know, in real life, that would be what the email is about. And then the job of the email usually is to get them to click on a link where you can branch out and and you can have, you know, long columns of testimonials, you can have a video, you can have all kinds of things going on that you don't want to clutter up the, the email with. So subject line, get them into the email. Email, one job, get them to click on a link where they're going to be taken to whatever else you do, whether it's an opt-in page or it's it's uh, an explanatory page at your blog where the PS is to buy something or whatever it is that you're doing. Just th think of these things as single steps in the process. Much like in real life, it would be yelling across the room, then starting the thing saying, hey, I got something really interesting. Come out here to my car. I, 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 I want to show it to you. I got it in the trunk or something. You know, it's like each step and then you open the trunk and then it's like, what you know, what, what, whatever you have. It's probably a dead buddy there. It. Yeah, right. That's what everybody <laughs> thinks when they think about trunks and cars. So, all right. Okay, well, uh, you touched. That's great. We got by two questions. Oh here. yeah. This is a new oh yeah. We're for... quickly running out of time here, <laughs> but nevertheless, I do want to kind of rewind a bit, and I want to just touch upon one thing, is that sent shivers down my spine when you said it, and it's power words. Now, I can even begin telling just how effective that thing is, and I believe that the report you've mentioned, the the power words report, I think I got like three pages out of that thing. That really helped me up my copywriting game. It took me from making no money to making 30 bucks a day, which, believe it or not, at that point in time, you know, was a lot of money for me. And then what happened was when I hit 100 bucks a day, I actually hired a woman from Czech Republic to go to your blog, John, and to literally do one blog post a day where she would go into the blog post and she would write out words and phrases with impact. Right? Interesting. Yeah, and so I have like a huge swipe file, like, you know, 80 pages worth of power words that, you know, that were pulled off your blog simply because I didn't know any, anyone else that I could study. And Interesting. Yeah, so I actually paid money to the person to go and scout for power words, and that was amazing. I mean, just that alone and just having some basic structure to writing, you know, up my game to a point where I was able, with no previous experience, no credibility, no case studies, to charge people 750 bucks per sales page. Again, to me, in Israel, six years ago, five years ago, a lot of money. In fact, that was paying my rent and bills for the month. So uh, that, I mean, power words alone can be a game changer for anyone doing email. Now, again, like I said, we are running the time, so our glass is quickly running out of sand. And I'm not sure how many questions we are going to be able uh, to do, but the one question that is really important for, for me to touch upon is the following one. And I get it all the time, by the way. Anytime I sit down with a new coaching client, that's one of the first things that I get. How long should an email really be? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's actually a, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's no easy answer to that. I have trained my readers to expect long ones but to occasionally get short ones so i like to divvy it up um there was a time a few years ago and i i believe this will come back again where i could actually make my sales message or make my sales argument or actually pitch inside of the email where the email where the job of the body of the email was not to send them to another link, but to actually get them to click on a buy now link. So I was actually doing that. We stopped doing that because um, there were various problems, one of which was, you know, having uh, uh, the, the kind of link we had or the length of the email increased the chances we would have some word or some phrase in there that would run afoul of the 
of the uh, of the spam bots out there and stuff. So we we started going um, we started going less and less. I think that a lot of people use really sparse short emails because of that fear of winding up in in the in the spam filter. I I I figure out what I need to do, and this this is the rule the rule to live by. I figure out what the job of this email is. If it's to get them to, you know, click on a link to go read more, to start to think about an upcoming event that they're going to want to sign up for, to get them interested in something, to actually, you know, to sell them on an affiliate product, whatever the job is, then I figure out what do I need to say to get them to do that one thing which is either click, usually click click on a link and get them to move over there. <clears throat> then however long it takes me to explain that to get the interest level high enough for them to click on this link, that's how long the email has to be. It's like the old thing of how long a, um, you know, a, a sales letter has to be or, you know, what, what, why do we use such long copy? And it's like we don't, the old school writers like me don't write long pieces because the length is what works. We use long pieces. We would happily write much shorter pieces if that worked. But what works is we start at the beginning of the sales process. We go through everything we need to do to be able to close that deal, which involves establishing credibility, uh, backing it up with 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 uh, things like like testimonials, uh, uh, stating a case, holding interest, um, doing case studies, bringing people into. Uh, further and further into our world, sharing things, um, uh, uh, moving through believability, supporting everything, bringing up the sales argument, doing the close. That takes a while to get through. If you find a way to shortcut that thing, then that's great. Do that. And people are always looking for a way to shortcut it. However, long-time people who are successful at sales know that there's an intellectual process, there's a, uh, an emotional process, there's all kinds of, there's even a physical process people have to go through if they have to pull out their credit card. All of these things you have to get past. You have to understand what it takes to get the person you're talking to to do the action that you want them to take. And if it's just click on a link here, then all you have to do is build up the interest and, and, and say the payoff, you know, essentially the payoff for this tension that we built up here, this idea that, you know, I'd love to tell you about this, but I don't have time in the email. But if you'll just click on this link, I will tell you all about X, all about how to whatever it is that is the most burning problem or issue in your life right now, then click on that. You're going to get a high click through. If, if you don't, if you just say, Hey, I've got a link here, you know, if you got some time, check it out. You know, you'll, you'll find out what it is when you get over there. You're going to have a very low, uh, cl uh, click through rate. So, so figure out what the job is and then what you need to do. So again, I've written long emails and I've written short emails. It, the length is much less important than what you're trying to accomplish. Think of this in terms of relationships. All of you, I believe, have at least asked for a date. A lot of you are married. When, when you get married, you have sold yourself on that person. You have done it over a period of time. Very few people walk up to the first woman they meet, or guy, let's, let's take a guy, walk up to the first woman they meet, say, you know what, you're kind of pretty, let's get married, and boom, they rush off to the justice of the peace, they get married and live happily ever after. That doesn't happen. There's a lot of getting to know uh, each other. There's the relationship. There's uh, future thinking. You know how how is he or she going to be five years from now, or when we have kids, or you know with, you know with, what kind of a job are they going to have later? A, a lot of these things start to happen. All of this plays into every relationship you have, including uh, the email relationship you you have with with somebody. You can't shortcut things. You can't just say, I would like to bond with you. So can we kind of assume we're bonded? Great. Okay. So now that we're bonded, you need to trust everything I say. So I want you to trust me and open up this email. 
you know, or op op open up this 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 link that I've I've sent you in this email. You can't do that. That doesn't work. That isn't how the human mind works. They, there needs to be a little bit of seduction there. There needs to be a little bit of romance. There needs to be a little bit of of uh, of of friendship, of, uh, a sharing. Uh, the, everything that goes into every relationship you have from the, the most important primary relationships you have to the relationships you have with the grocer or the cop that just pulled you over and is kind of waffling whether to give you a ticket or not. What do you, you know, what do you do? How do you bond? How do you, how do you get them to start thinking in sync with you so that you're on the same page and that what you want to have happen then becomes what they want to have happen too. They, you want them to buy. They want to buy now, not to please you, but because you've convinced them that this is something that they want. It's the same thing for getting them to click on the link in the email. You want them to click on the email. They may be skeptical, not want to do it, and if you convince them, though, um, then they may click on it and move to the next stage the same way they thought about opening your email, depending on, on the subject line in the first place. So whatever it takes to say, you should be able to say. If you write a long email, it needs to be interesting, and that's where you get into copy stuff about what's interesting to the person reading it, not what's interesting to you, Igor, the guy writing it, what's interesting to me, the guy reading it. As long as you stay inside of my interests, as long as you make this all about me, I, can, I will hang with you for eight pages of an email. There's right. no limit. To, there's no limit to what people – you know, the, the VSLs, the video sales letters that are working – even now, they tend to be closer to 30 minutes than three minutes, the ones that work to actually close the deal. I don't, I, I don't sit down and hope for an a, uh, email to a link for a video sales letter that's going to take up 30 minutes of my time. I'm not sitting there hoping for that. But if that guy does his job, if the writer and keeps it interesting and stays inside of my interest level, I'm going to watch the 30-minute video. I'm going to read the long email that gets me over there. I, and after the video, if it takes me to another page where I got to read something before I get my credit card out and actually buy something, I'm going to do that if you hold my interest. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. I mean, that's old school copywriting right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, all right. very, very old school. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, you're very, very old after all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, we did come up to the top of the hour. So, John, you basically, you know, you're calling the shots here. So, do we have time for one, two more questions? I, I Rather than go to the question, let me... Let me pick one of the ones that uh, that I think you should talk about, which is which is how how you can establish authority, and then then I think I think that's a that's a good place to to, to kind of wind up. I okay. think a lot of people don't understand how to put how to present themselves as the authority in whatever market or niche they're in. How you know how if if you don't have any authority, if you're just starting out, then what what I tell people to do is to deconstruct where you're at within the market. Don't assume that what you say carries any authority with anyone on your list unless you're positive that it does. And if it doesn't, then you need to establish authority. This is what I call, this is going to get just slightly technical here. There is push marketing and there is pull marketing. Push marketing would be something like somebody who is an authority, say, um, let's, let's say I'm writing to people who are looking to get better at copywriting. They have clearly identified me as a guy who has authority and they're going to listen to what I say. I would then push. I might send an email saying, you need to look at this right now. You know, this is going to show you how to blah, blah, blah. Do this right now. Don't do it later. I could actually get a high click-through rate with that kind of pushing people into it, okay? The, if, if I didn't have authority, if I was going to people who didn't know who I was, uh, who didn't know that what I said carried value to other people, if they didn't know me from Adam, I'm, I would have to establish authority, and that would be a pull. So the email would not be pushing them to do something, it would be pulling them and saying, so rather than talk about you've got to go here to be able to learn how to write better, say, would you like to sell more? Would you like to, you know, how, how would you like to spend less time in the office 
and bring more money into your bottom line so that you have a great lifestyle full of free time and you know with with the money to spend on traveling and blah 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 click on this and I'll, I'll tell you the secrets of how to do this and the secrets would be how to write copy in an ad that's going to increase your 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 business that would be pull so figure out where you are with your list are you are you in a position to push a, even a little bit a lot or a little if uh, it, the, the authority who pushes sometimes you're warning people you're saying you know there is only one day left you need to go over here right now or it's gone and if you have the authority where I believe you I believe that you wouldn't lie to me you wouldn't stretch the truth this really is going going away tomorrow and during a launch I will do that because launches do end you know at, tw at you know 12 noon on Saturday afternoon the switch goes off the page goes off the, it goes dark and you're you're out of luck then you know they, they believe me that is pushing very very hard otherwise early in the launch I might pull I might say you know this is a way to do this you know there's going to be a week worth of stuff going on here but the sooner you get over there the better it's going to be you know blah 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 and I'm I, you know I'm beginning to hit them so I don't want to scare them off but I want them, I want it on their radar that this is something that's a limited time, but they've got time to get over there. But now's the time to get going, and I'm just starting to, to put the pedal to the metal. So if you don't have authority, you start to establish it by, it's a process. You can't suddenly be interesting to someone who doesn't find you interesting. You have to do it. Whatever you have to do, figure out where you're at and what you need to accomplish and able to get authority. It might be you need to make a million dollars in a month so that then you can go say, I'm the guy that knows how to make a million dollars in a month. Maybe that is, is your idea of, of, of authority. Or you may just, like for me, for example, I've got 30 years in the frontline trenches of the business world. I've seen it all. I've been a very, very successful guy. I'm sought after writer. All of this stuff gets into into my authority. For a guy who isn't in that position, who's only in his first year of writing, say, then you're not going to be in authority, but you can still present yourself as being the harbinger of good information. You are the guy that is going to present something that that the reader hasn't thought about or didn't know existed or or that that can help them immediately and quickly and and your authority comes with a it's like a temporary authority. It's like a badge that gets you in the door of, of your reader's life for a period of time while we're discussing this particular thing. You do that over and over again over a period of time and your authority starts to naturally build and then you get to the point where somebody says, oh, an email from Igor. I got to see what he has to say as opposed to who's this guy Igor again? I vaguely remember getting on his list. So just understand where you are in that kind of in the lay of the land. Don't try to don't try to shortcut it. Just enjoy the process. Building authority is fun. You know, one one of the things that a lot of new entrepreneurs don't realize even though people have told them before is that old entrepreneurs will talk fondly about the rise where the, when they went from zero to their first fortune. That's the most fun that they've ever had in their lives. That's the that's where that's where they're discovering things, where things are vibrant. It can actually get born in a lot of entrepreneurs once they make that first million dollars or whatever. What happens unconsciously is they start thinking of ways to sabotage it because they want to get back to that happy days of everything going right and and they're building a business as opposed to trying to manage a business that's already been built. So there's a lot of psychology going on in there. But you know, if if things are working for you, if you're getting small bumps in your in your open rates and then your your click throughs and your conversions, that's the fun time. That's when things are happening, and that's when you should really enjoy this process. So there are shortcuts to a lot of things in business. Some things there just aren't shortcuts to, and one of those is real authority and real. You know, you can't shortcut experience. You can't pretend that you have 30 years experience if you don't. And why should you? Because you can have one year experience and just whatever you bring to the table is what you bring to the table. So rather than trying to pretend you're an old grizzled guy who's seen it all, you admit, I haven't seen it all. But what I have seen is this. And this that I'm going to share with you is going to make your life better right now. And, and let's, get, let's get on with it. Well, the thing is that about authority, the one short, shortcut, actually, I think it is a shortcut. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, John, tell me if I'm wrong or not. 
um, is is writing off of what other people know and simply giving credit. So so I, I see what what I used to do is I used to learn something from say guys like Ryan Dice or Frank Kern or whatever, and then I would preach that. But I would actually give credit and say, here's something I learned from Ryan Dice. Sure, you become the conduit. That that goes back to that guide thing I was talking about. You are helping someone into a world that they don't understand. They may not know who Ryan Dice is. They, they, or they may not know how to translate what he's saying. They don't know if he's if he's real or not. They don't know a lot of things. So you come and you can be the guy who kind of clarifies things. You can be part of that. So your relationship is that of a guide or somebody who translates things or makes them makes them palatable to someone who isn't sure who to trust. That's the main thing out there in the world is people don't know who to trust. When they find someone they can trust, that's where the relationship gets real in, in a hurry and where things can really start happening. Well, it's kind of like being the Napoleon Hill of whatever you're doing, right? Because Napoleon mm -hmm. Hill built a career off of interviewing experts and simply summing up what they know into an applicable concept. And you you're know, absolutely right. right. And people talk about mm -hmm. people talk about Nap Hill and Nap Hill's book. When in fact, he did none of this. He just interviewed people, and he was the he was the messenger, so to speak. Very, yeah. very good point. Yeah, so, but he, he has become an authority. And, you know, I can't remember, you know, half the names uh, out, of the, out of the book, but I can remember that Napoleon Hill was the one to deliver all these concepts and to go and interview the people. So, yep. you know, obviously his name stuck through the ages, even though the guy died broke and, uh, you know, supposedly didn't have much success in his own life. But then again, he is an authority on building riches into your own life. Anyway, John, I, I, that was an amazing eye-opener even for me. A lot of refreshing going on. And anyone who's making very little, not making anything right now with email marketing or you know, marketing whatsoever, um, I think it was an amazing hour invested. And I thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this hour with us. Uh, anything else you want to add? Perhaps you know, uh, you know, plug in your website of any sort. Anything? Well, uh, you you mentioned my website. And I'm sure you'll you'll make sure people go over there. That's probably the main place to like get started with me and to go to find out what's going on. And it's kind of a central. It's it's like the uh, the, the central meeting place for anybody who wants to find out what's what's going on with me and what's happening. That would be John Dash Carlton dot com. J O H N Dash C A R L T O N dot com. There's a decade's worth of free archives there. I post at least every month. Uh, for periods of time, I post a lot. Ninety percent of the posts are informative stuff. Uh, you know, it's not not selling stuff it's not angling stuff occasionally i will let you know if a, if a launch is going on or i will i will alert people to various opportunities but most of the time we're just talking marketing salesmanship writing things like that um it's kind of like a long extended you know mentoring program and you're free to go in there and wander the archives and if you want to find out more about what i have and what's going on it's all there on the page so that's a that's a really excellent first stop and you'll find out you know everything you need to know about me and if anything i mean that that is just a gold mine of power words of you know yeah. templates you can use and just studying you know in, in impactful writing and influential writing in a way how you suppose how you need to deliver ideas how you need to really bond with your audience and you know there's a lot of posts that stuck th you know with me through time like the one post where you were talking about how back in the day you didn't really get the people who were chasing the money and the cars and the apartments and mm -hmm. the whatever and then you want just to spend your time just sitting there looking at the wall ruminating you know, that mm -hmm. word stuck when they're ruminating. And then there was another post that really, you know, got to me when uh, Steve Jobs died. And you were kind of devoted, like, a, a very long post just to sharing how he was a visionary and how he, like, flipped the industry upside down. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff happens there. And if you're a marketer, if you're an influencer or aspiring to become one, I really recommend you go to john-carlton.com and then check out what's going on. Excellent. Alrighty, so John, thank you so much again. I'll let you go. I know you're a busy guy, and you know uh, the coffee shop that I'm doing this from is actually shutting down because it's all, you know 10 p.m. here. So oh, I forgot it's late at night there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I stayed up late just for you. So uh, you know you go, <laughs> and uh, thank you so much one more time, and I hope you have a great rest of the week.
Thank you, Igor. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Have, right. a, have a great uh, weekend. Talk Thank to you, you later. Bye. Bye.